Welcome to Natural Resources University. This week's episode features Deer University, hosted by Bronson Strickland and Steve Damaris. Welcome to Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. I'm Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. We're both lifelong hunters, deer biologists, professors of wildlife management, and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. We explain the latest research, including our own work and that conducted elsewhere. So if you're interested in deer biology and management, this is your podcast. Every decision you make is a step in your management program, and we give you the knowledge to make every decision count. Welcome back to the Deer University podcast. Uh, I am delighted today to be, of course, joined by Steve Damaris. And uh, I'm going to pass it along to Steve now because he is going to welcome a, a very special guest. Yeah, uh, Bronson, it's it's really great to have a special guest with us today. Everybody's familiar that with the MSU Deer Lab as the kind of the base of our operations, but we have kind of the founding father of the MSU Deer Lab, Dr. Harry Jacobson, with us today. Harry uh, started at Mississippi State in the 1970s, and uh, I was excited as a young professional to come down and uh, go to grad school under him. And Harry, thank you for joining us today. Great to be here, Steve and Bronson. Uh, uh, miss seeing you guys, and, but, it, but it's great to see your faces. and. And after all the all the COVID uh, uh, withdrawals, so yeah, well, Harry, we're still great not to see you. together, but yeah. at least we're mm-hmm. yeah. visual. Yeah, we we haven't gotten any prettier, and I still don't have any hair, so some <laughs> things never change. Well, I'm about to join you on the hair. I'm and mine <laughs> mine keeps disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> It'll do that to you. <laughs> well, Harry, we do go a long way back because I started uh, under you as a graduate student in 1977 and uh, worked on my master's, and then you invited me to stay for my Ph.D., and, and that was all such a blessing for me to be able to uh, be a part of that early research. And thinking back, I remember you helped you know, kind of build the foundation of who I was professionally. And one of the things I remember you uh, just really pounding into the cadre of graduate students that were under you is, you know, we are involved in research and we got to do things that are of benefit to the resource. And and that's just kind of was your mantra back then and learn information that's going to help with the management of the resource. And and I've, I've lived that and uh, Bronson lives it as well. So uh, it's a great founding father of the lab, finding founding that principle with us. Well, that's that's nice of you to say, Steve. Uh, I think the 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 greatest accomplishment that I can point to is that uh, uh, I've got students, and and particularly you, and 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 Bronson as a as a side. Uh, 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 person to, to uh, also uh, uh, input some knowledge to, but, but uh, the, the greatest accomplishment has been being able to see my students perform and outperform me and, and creating uh, uh, new knowledge uh, for uh, the management of the wildlife resources in general. Yeah been a great collective cooperative effort amongst a bunch of people and uh, you were instrumental in, in making me appreciate the relationship with our state wildlife agency uh, back in those days and uh, working with agencies and helping them answer the research questions that they need to properly manage the, the resources and of course you know the three of us here folk have focused a lot on deer over our years, but we've done a lot of other things too. But, uh, you know, I saw a presentation about a year ago by QDMA, uh, uh, Kip Adams. Uh, he, he did a survey of, uh, Southeastern state agencies. And the report he gave was that 80% of the effort 
by state wildlife agencies in the southeast goes towards deer. And good or bad, right or wrong, that, that's just the fact of life for state agencies. And, and so us being able to work with that species and address the needs has really been uh, a great blessing and a lot of fun for me. And uh, I know Bronson and, and I'll bet for you too, Harry. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I couldn't uh, pick anything else. I'd, I'd, I'd like to do more dearly than, than, than work with the deer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what, well, what I, I've got one comment okay, real go quick, Steve. We're, we're kind of going down memory lane here, and we're talking about how good it is to, to see each other, and, uh, and it is. But I, and I think everyone in the deer management world loves to see Harry Jacobson, loves to see him coming, loves to have a conversation with him, except one group of people. There's one group of people that do not like to see Harry Jacobson stand up and go to the microphone. <laughs> yes. And that's all us graduate students that were up at the Southeastern Deer Study Group presenting our research. And, uh, you know, if you could put some kind of sensor on people's knees or, the, or their heart rate or something, it's like, oh, God, I hope I was going to make it through my presentation without Harry Jacobson asking me a question. So uh, yeah. you, you do know that, don't you, Harry? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. I believe, <laughs> I believe in holding students to task. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, a, it's a great way to challenge us. If we can't defend our, our work... In, in front of a three or four hundred professionals, then we don't need to be in, in the place that we're at. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. And I don't think you ever stumped Bronson. No, I don't think so. No, uh, I don't think I stumped you either. That, well, <laughs> you, you, you guys have very, that's very kind, but you, you have very uh, bad memory. <laughs> Because my, my my very first presentation when I was a master's student, Harry Jacobson, I'm like, how how can this be? I'm up there on the pan, you know, I was like the third speaker or fourth speaker, I don't know. And uh, it was right after lunch, if I remember correctly. And you were not in the room because, buddy, I was looking and watching. I'm like, gosh, good. Harry's not in the room. <laughs> and about the presentation before me, I see him walk in, and he parks it like on the front row. And uh, and Harry did ask me a question, and I completely botched it. I mean, I still to this day remember how horrific my, my answer was. So I failed, Harry. <laughs> well, you made up for it. <laughs> I, I hope, hopefully, I made up for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great recollection, Bronson, and and I do. I mean, I've had a lot of other students over the years that have said the same thing, too, that, oh, here comes Jacobson. Watch out. <laughs> so, it, it's a great, I mean, it truly is a, a good thing to be critical and uh, challenge mm -hmm. our information, because if we can't discuss it among professionals, then how can we validly discuss it to uh, our stakeholders? It's, it it right. falls within the peer review of the uh, uh, of science by uh, with the empirical method uh, uh, if you if you can't justify uh, your your results then uh, uh, you need to go back to the drawing board well Steve why don't why don't you two kick us off and like how it all got started years ago yeah uh, well I, I wasn't the first student in, in the deer lab. I think there were a couple others that came in right before me, but uh, I know I was there at kind of at the ground ground zero with, with you and Dave Gwynn, uh, your colleague that uh, moved on to other places uh, shortly after that. But you're yeah, thinking back about the, the first projects that at least I was involved with, and, and that was early in the, the life of the Deer Lab. And, and Harry, you, you developed a relationship with the state agency, and, and they had a lot of needs relative to deer research. And can you kind of think back sure. and uh, think about what their needs were then and, and why you did what you did, you and Dave Gwynn? Well, I was very fortunate in that, that we were able to uh, – I was able to come on board uh, Mississippi State uh, – at a time when when Mississippi was struggling financially for research support, 
Uh, and what was happening was uh, basically they were having to turn their, their Pittman-Robinson money back in because uh, they, they couldn't support the matching fund part of, of those, those funds. And so they were losing uh, lots of money that could have gone to research annually. And uh, a, as a result of efforts uh, primarily by Edsel Clyburn, uh, uh, who is uh, the, the research director for the Mississippi Department at that time, uh, Dave Gwynn and myself, we were able to uh, develop uh, a, a program where we essentially became the research arm of the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. And uh, we were able to use our university salaries and uh, uh, work as, as overhead funds to match the Pittman Robinson uh, uh, requirements, and that turned into just just a wonderful relationship between the department and uh, and the university uh, that's carried through the, to this day. Uh, and I think it's unlike any other uh, state in the country, and one of the reasons that Mississippi is in my opinion, the, the, the top wildlife uh, research uh, uh, agency and, 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 and state uh, management agency in, in the country. There's no, no other one like it uh, uh, that has made so many advances and, and really with uh, minimal staff compared to what other state agencies have had over the years. Uh, when I came on board, uh, I think uh, Mississippi had six uh, wildlife biologists total uh, to do everything that they they had to do, uh, and uh, that that hasn't grown that much since then. But uh, but the output is unlike any other state. What were some of the topics that were hot back then that, that needed to be addressed? Well, of course, on, on the deer management side, uh, the, the issues of, of overpopulation, uh, particularly in the coastal plain and, and well, statewide, uh, there was, uh, uh, like, like uh, almost every place uh, in the country in those days, uh, uh, those were the sacred animal that, like the, like the sacred cow. Uh, the you, doe harvest was 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 not a thing that was was appreciated at, at that point in time. And uh, one of the the, the major uh, issues that we had to accomplish was to convince the public that managing deer populations meant managing the whole population, not just the buck segment of the population. And I can remember doing meetings across the state with with the public and the, and the state agency where uh, literally I, I had to have uh, conservation officers walk into the meeting with me and, and walk out because they didn't know uh, what what kind of anger I would uh, uh, create and, and uh, uh, what, what might be the consequences of that. <laughs> so, uh, but wow. uh, we, were, we were able to demonstrate uh, largely through uh, the research that we were conducting, some of which you were a major part of, uh, determining uh, health uh, uh, indices for for uh, measuring deer deer uh, welfare uh, and using those in a management context, uh, that we were able to show that uh, there there was substantial overpopulation in many many parts of the states where we were seeing hundred hundred percent spike yearling bucks, uh, extremely low body weights. Uh, 
uh, all symptoms of malnourishment and and we were able to because we were able to show that uh, garner public support for uh, a population management that that was sound for deer and sound for their habitat. As I remember, you, Steve, you, that, uh, would it be good right here for a, a lot of our people that are younger than us? And it, that that's not hard at all to be younger than us. But I, I find sometimes that that a lot of people that are younger don't understand why there there was such a response like Harry was describing because doe harvest is so commonplace now but we we were talking about a time and people that grew up with no deer or very few deer on the landscape and so it literally took uh, a couple decades for populations to build and then people like harry were there at a time when uh, through their research and observations and feedback with biologists were starting to notice these density dependent effects that density was negatively impacting the population and and just provide a little background there to what harry was talking about it it was a really different time yeah and harry you you spent probably your first 10 years or so literally educating a generation of hunters and new younger upcoming hunters about just the need for population regulation involving the doe component of the demographic yeah absolutely and and you know this uh, that uh, uh, issue that that uh, Bronson just talked about in terms of the uh, deer numbers uh, increasing dramatically over time from from a populations that were near extinction and were in some cases in some states extirpated uh, to uh, the late 60s and early 70s when those populations finally caught up with a with a habitat that was available to support them. Uh, I grew up as a as a kid in Michigan where I saw that at a lot earlier time uh, because uh, the the Midwest uh, lake states always had uh, fairly high populations of, of deer. And uh, I, I can remember in the 50s w- walking through the, the woods uh, in mid-central uh, Michigan uh, and, and after a se- severe winter and literally seeing 40 or 50 deer, uh, dead deer uh, in and a few hundred acres, and uh, and and Michigan, I think, uh, uh, was, you know, they they went through that battle well before what we did in the in the southeast. And fortunately, I had that experience to to draw on to and and to realize uh, what kind of public uh, effort that would take to to turn things around. Well, since we're talking about density so much, Harry, uh, I remember when when I was a master's student, um, one of your studies that had a really big impact on me because it it was a time series that, uh, and I can't remember the venue that you presented it at, maybe the biology of deer uh, or something like that, but it was essentially your your case study at at Davis Island, and you had this terrific, uh, I want to say close to 20 years, certainly 15 or so years of where you were tracking all the normal metrics of deer management, the body weight and antler size and lactation, etc. And you had this perfect correlation with a, I believe it was a two-year lag. Exactly, yeah where you you tracked body weight and you were tracking numbers and deer harvest and then about two years was the best correlation post harvest you would see a perfect mirrored response of of whatever metric you were looking at and that that was really a a big deal i mean it it was pivotal for me in and understanding that relationship i'm wondering uh how well was that accepted and how much 
convincing and arm twisting did it take for you to get that level of harvest? Well, I think I think it was because of the changes that we were able to demonstrate that we were able to get that level of harvest. Uh, I mean, and, and that data set was was extremely helpful in, in convincing the uh, the hunting clubs on Davis Island uh, and others to uh, realize that that managing that deer population through uh, doe harvest was was basically the only way to keep it in balance with this uh, habitat. And we were able to show that uh, not just at, at Davis Island. We had a similar database for Knoxby National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, which had, you know, showed the same metrics. Now, when you get down to the coastal plain, where uh, you, you you don't see that density response as quickly because uh, of, of such a lower quality in habitat and, and environment that uh, it wasn't as easy to demonstrate there, but... Uh, but when we were doing health checks at, at, at the wildlife management areas, I think Red Creek and, and Leaf River, uh, we were able to show, uh, I mean, yearling buck weights that were uh, averaging 40 pounds dress weight, which, which should have been fawn weights, you know. Uh, and, and those populations down there were, uh, you would still see fairly high energy stores because they were getting the energy. They just weren't getting the, the, the protein. There was enough uh, uh, gall, uh, gallberry and other things down there that were relatively high in energy but, but very low in protein. And, and uh, we were able to show uh, what deer were doing to their environment as well. We put some exclosures up down there and, and were uh, able to demonstrate the disappearance of plants completely because of uh, the, the deer numbers that were, were present and, and all of the, the valuable browse species that, uh, that the only way to maintain those is to keep deer at and much lower densities than, than they were being kept at. So density dependence was and is operating in that part of the country. It's just not as sensitive. Uh, you're not going to have as an immediate of, of a response as you would in a place like Davis Island or a place with uh, with a lot of a lot of food readily available. Abs absolutely. High-quality yeah. food, I should add. And that relates back yeah. to the productivity of the of the soils which you guys know well you've been uh you've been following the the relationship between uh soil fertility and and uh deer metrics uh and and uh and we were able to show that too and and thank you for following on with that work so so uh diligently and uh to the point where I think we we really do understand uh, the the relationship between the soils and and the plant and animal environment that that uh, they they produce. Harry, uh, uh, sorry, Steve. I'm just some of these memories just are are popping up, but uh, right ahead. and I think I think Harry, you and I even corresponded about this a year or so ago but but i remember another another one of those uh case studies you did was in florida yes and, and i i believe it was it was the relationship you're describing even to a further extent relative to the, the number of deer that had to be removed from that landscape before you started to see a density dependent response and i i think the response variable you were using was recruitment or fawns at heel or something like that. Relative to that, Harry, back in those days were were food plots and and mechanisms like that to add a lot more quality forage on the landscape. W was that even a thing back in in those days? No, nowhere near 
like it is today. Uh, you know, when I when I grew up as a youngster, uh, in those times, uh, deer management was or or deer hunting was totally different from what we see across the landscape today. Uh, I grew up at a time uh, when uh, the the primary deer hunting group was uh, n- numbers of hunting camps with large numbers of people uh, and, and that uh, uh, with with a very short season where everything was a social event. Uh, people got together and and uh, uh, they did man deer drives. Uh, you might have. 40 hunters from a, a given camp go out and do a man deer drive and then uh, the, the the whole thing went back to a social experience without really the connection to the to the land that we see in the in the deer hunting base today uh where I think uh deer hunting is still a very social thing but it's it's much more a smaller a uh, group of, of of folks usually, uh, and it, it's uh, a year-round thing uh, with with uh, landowners uh, managing that resource uh, for for recreational benefit, but but also also for uh, the environment that they're uh, they're involved with. It's a it's a totally different experience today, I think, from what it was forty, fifty years ago. Uh, the hunters are much more educated today uh, and much more involved Absolutely. In, in the stewardship of of the the properties that they hunt on. So Speaking Harry, of that education, Harry, I will, what, one last little comment, yeah. Steve. I'll pass it. I've had so many people, another one of these random thoughts comes up. I've had so many people, Harry, over, over the years with my extension and outreach program and uh, will, will come up to me and talk about uh, the, the programs you and others used to deliver so many years ago. And I, I thought it would be gratifying for you to know that so many people still remember that and it still had an impact and they always tell me to to tell you hello and they appreciated it. Well, thank you for that. Likewise, Harry, I've seen, had, had that happen dozens of times at presentations throughout the state. Well, one of the, the biggest things that we were able to do uh, was to use the Deer Lab uh, as the, I guess uh, the the hook, if you want to call it that, to to get people to come out and and learn about deer. I mean, everybody wanted to come see the uh, the deer pens and and the, and the deer within the deer pens, uh, and we were able to put on a short course, uh, literally with. Uh, uh, the the support of of the state agency state wildlife agency and and probably the 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 first participants in that deer short course were the agency personnel themselves uh and and myself and and the wildlife biologists within that within the agency put put on a day long course uh uh covering all aspects of of uh, the white-tailed deer, and it was extremely well received. And we ran, you know, I I can't tell you how many people ran. We ran through that over about a ten-year period. That, uh, and and they all became ambassadors to, uh, again for the stewardship of the of the white-tailed deer resource. And things change over time, and. Uh, I want to, maybe if I can remember both things I, by the time we're done talking here, but one of the things is, you know, you can't just do some research one decade and solve the problem for the next 40 years. And the example for that, in my mind, is 
Bronson led a, a re, another a supplemental analysis from that Davis Island harvest data uh, from the next 15 years after your database. And, and Bronson, you want to kind of summarize, you know, as, as I recollect, the uh, how it changed the responses of the animals kind of changed compared to Harry's time frame. Yeah. So uh, and gosh, Steve, that's. Uh... I hate to say it too, but that it's been a number of years ago <laughs> since I did that. But, but, but to me, the take home was, uh, harvest w was still important, of, of course, but we also documented some environmental effects. And of course, the biggie in, in that neck of the woods is the flooding, the flooding effects that were taking place. But we did not have as strong of a signal of density dependence that Harry demonstrated simply because we did not have the variation in the swing of harvest level. So Harry, more or less, they had kind of moved into a, a stable strategy of harvest rates. So where you, and I'm making these numbers up, but you had maybe advocated for a swing of an additional 300 or 500 or whatever, we had to analyze the data set relative to a swing of an additional 50 deer or 75 mm -hmm. deer. And and we saw some subtle effects, but not near what what you saw, because we didn't have the variation in harvest level. Yeah, by that time they yeah, they I, were I managing, that. they were managing numbers at 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 a level where uh, they weren't anywhere near carrying capacity. They were they were managing at a sustained level where where habitat was not being uh, damaged from from one year to the next because because of their harvest practices. Yeah. And I think you've probably seen it with a lot of properties you've worked with, Harry, and we've seen it as well as hunters kind of get to this workload level for deer management and, and doe harvesting is part of the work of deer management. Everybody loves to shoot a, a big buck, but the real work and, and the way you get to the better deer is through the day-to-day what you need to do to manage the deer population. And so I think at Davis Island and, and a lot of places across Mississippi and the Southeast and probably the U S hunters have, they've gotten over the fact that they need to keep more, shooting more and more does. They, they've reached that saturation point. And so we just didn't have any of those additional pushes. I think if, if we could have doubled the doe harvest, like, you know, you probably in, in your data set, you were going from, you know, a 1x increase to a 2x, maybe a 3x in the number of does that we're harvesting. They just couldn't do that anymore. They'd reach that saturation point. And that's why we need to keep doing more research over time as circumstances change to learn these nuances. Um, and then talking about generational education, Harry, uh, you went from the you know, the 70s and, and into the 80s, teaching hunters to harvest does. And then you were a really a, a founding, one of the founding uh, factors and, and members of the Quality Deer Management Association. And that establishing the, the new paradigm of, okay, we got doe numbers reduced. Now let's start protecting some bucks and letting them grow older. And you kind of, could you touch on that a little bit for us? Because that's kind of old hat for a the younger people in, in deer management now, but it was new back then. And, and uh, you know, we went through a time, everybody likes to, you know, wants to shoot a big buck. And uh, when we first got into deer management in Mississippi and, and across the country, really, uh, what, what we saw from the metrics was, you know, 90% of the, of the buck harvest was yearling, yearling bucks. And we realized that, that we were overexploiting that resource tremendously. And in fact, if you look back in terms of archeological records, you know, a, a natural deer population, uh, isn't isn't anything like that uh that that uh uh it's it's more towards a balanced sex ratio uh, still even in even in a uh, uh archaeological sense uh uh those 
always sort of dominate the the, the population uh, simply because they're longer lived than than males. But but the the, the natural populations out there from archaeological runes show that uh, a high percentage of the population is composed of mature bucks, and uh, the the harvest strategies that that uh, most state agencies and and uh, private lands we're using were uh, basically maximum sustained harvests of 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 bucks and and that created uh, the the dilemma of uh, bucks just not surviving to to the ages that uh, uh, they they would produce the mature antler quality that that any hunter wants to see. Uh, so we were involved in looking at ways of getting hunters to let let those younger bucks walk and uh, achieve the age. And when when they did that, they they saw dramatic improvements of of the age structure and the antler quality of uh, of that that resource across the state of Mississippi. Uh, the the early uh, attempts at that were, uh, you know, protect uh, bucks by by the number of points, uh, and we all know that that that's not uh, a a really satisfactory uh, way of protecting younger bucks because uh, you can have younger bucks with eight points, uh, yearling bucks with eight points, and uh, other strategies needed to be involved in, and you can do that by limiting the harvest to uh, 20, 30 percent of the buck population, or you can do that by uh, in, installing antler restrictions that, that are more realistic of age classes, uh, beam length and uh, antler spread, for example, are, are, are commonly used today. Uh, as we went through that, and Davis Island's a good example, uh, uh, we, I was able to get the hunters at, on Davis Island to uh, first restrict their harvest to uh, antler beam lengths that were, uh, I think, 15 inches at the time, which protected basically all uh, all the yearling bucks on, on Davis Island. And, and then when they did that, uh, they they saw that was working, but they wanted to go further, and 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 they began to protect bucks with twenty to twenty two inch beam lengths, and and started harvesting those mature bucks that 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 they all wanted to harvest, and and a tremendous uh, change in the satisfaction from the hunting experience by letting those younger bucks walk, and and being able to see. Bucks act out uh, their uh, in their natural ways uh, uh, and and watch them uh, in, instead of shooting them. You know, uh, so uh, big change in in hunter attitude and and also quality of of the animals they were harvesting. Steve, one thing you you haven't talked about is is I believe it was your PhD project where uh, y'all did so much of I, I think a lot of the the first research on using uh, spring springtime doe harvest or what we call spring health checks and why don't y'all talk a little bit about how that began and what was the impetus for doing that and uh, because in a lot of places that is still used today. You know, it was about, you know, Harry mentioned earlier about evaluating the health of the animal population back then in the early days. And and Harry saw that, well, I'm going to let you describe what you saw, Harry. I, I was a riding along with you in your boat. Well, I mean, to be able to look at uh, reproductive success, for example, and uh, to look at, be able to look at, uh, at the animal at the end of the winter period, which 
gave us the best barometer on on what the actual uh, health condition of the, that those populations uh, were, uh, which you you can't get from just looking at an animal in the in in the fall. So we were looking at oh a whole range of of, of different issues. So Steve uh, did a tremendous job on looking at the at, at, at parasite levels, for example, uh, and and the the relationship between density and nutritional condition and and disease prevalence is 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 an issue. It's it's something that's a a major factor in in the, the condition of those deer populations, but also a, a major indicator of of the status of that population relative to its habitat. One of the things that that I I'd like to jump into is is uh, that that whole role of nutrition as as it relates to uh, to the resource. Uh, one of the things I've been able to do over the years, and particularly uh, following my retirement from Mississippi State and, and working as, as a consultant for private lands, uh, I've been able to watch some amazing uh, uh, accomplishments of, of change of uh, deer quality uh, due to uh, uh, change in harvest structure and 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 change in nutritional quality of of individual properties, and I can I can cite uh, properties in Louisiana, Texas, and of course Mississippi, uh, even New York, and and some of the other areas that I've worked with over the years where. Uh, th- once I got landowners and and hunting clubs that owned those properties to come to the realization that they could greatly improve nutrition by bringing those deer numbers down to uh, to an adequate size for what the habitat would produce, uh, and by by uh, planting food plots and and doing other. Uh, making other changes to to the natural habitat through forest management uh selective harvest uh, uh and things like control burning all of those enter into that whole nutritional uh relationship uh, been able to show those landowners that yes you can you can really boost the the quality of those animals but one of the things that surprised me i expected that uh and, and primarily because we're we're keen on mature buck harvest uh, i expected in in five to six years time once we got those populations in check you know we we would reach the optimum level of of uh, quality for those those deer herds, and we did. We see we saw some re- remarkable changes. Uh, for example, uh, uh, I can think of Juniper Creek in South Mississippi, where uh, we in in about six years' time after getting that deer population down, uh, the the owners of that property saw uh, about a. a 20% gain in antler quality went from uh, average mature books of 110 to 120 inches to 130 inches. Uh, and and we rolled along at that level for another five years. And then all of a sudden, uh, just out of nowhere, uh, we saw major increases in antler quality uh going from harvesting the best bucks at 130 inches to harvesting 160 inch bucks and and uh average bucks over 140 inches uh and i saw that 
time in and time out over, regardless of where I was working in North America, that it always seemed if, if, if we got things nutritionally right, that it took 10 years. And then all of a sudden we saw major increases in quality. And I, I never really got a handle on why that would be until you guys, my follow-ons, came in with uh, the maternal generation uh, effects that that and, and you've been able to demonstrate it so greatly that uh, that that first generation of female offspring from from those that are raised on optimum nutrition uh, and, and and the female and male offspring, yeah, you see a, 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 a small jump in quality, but what happens is you see a tremendous jump in quality after you look at that second generation from from that doe that was was raised from a doe that had optimum nutrition and herself had optimum nutrition and and we we saw that what you call epigenetic uh effect of of maternal nutrition and i've seen that in uh, in wild populations time and time again and, and I now, if I talk to to a landowner, I say, and they say, "How long will it take for me to get to where I want to go?" You know, I say, "Well, at least ten years, because you've you've got uh, you're 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 harvesting bucks at five years of age, and uh, you're going to have to go through two generations to get that that second uh, generation of of." of bucks that that will show that quality change so. it's it's not it, it's what you ate is important but just as importantly it's what your mother ate and what your grandmother ate and, and this type of scale so we you'll see a short-term response to the nutrition whether it be the food plots or prescribed fire and uh forest management etc but yeah it's that it's that intergenerational effect that that's really where the switches get flipped and, and where you see the big gains. And Harry, it's just so wonderful to hear that you've had clients and people that are working with you that are sticking with it that long because it, it really is. It, it's, a, it's a program you got to stick with for a long time. But if you do, uh, it's going to take about a decade. But that's when the uh, that, that's when you really see the big swings. Yeah. And it really speaks to landowners. You know, you can tell them that having data to support it and show them and, and get them to appreciate that there's no quick fix in deer management. Yeah, you might see a quick response to some extent, but it's a long-term investment. It's a generational investment and long-term habitat improvement, the nutritional improvement for the deer population addressing multiple generations and uh, you know there's some research out of Europe back in the World War II days that you know showed uh, literally doubling body weights and antler sizes over four or five generations of, of deer and uh, I would love to you know whoever follows me and Bronson in this situation may be able to speak to that third fourth and fifth generation impact yeah, absolutely, and and you know what a what a uh, great achievement by the Deer Lab there at Mississippi State and you guys to, to be able to demonstrate that. Yeah. Harry, this may be uh, it, uh, we, we can always uh, cut it out if it's if it's too weird of a question. <laughs> something something I've been thinking about. I think you're the perfect person to answer because. Like we said earlier, you've worked in South Mississippi, the Gulf Coast, and the Florida, and then New York and the Midwest and all over the place. And um, how big of a constraint do you think it is for deer in the, the deep south 
physiologically having to deal with heat dissipation. And you know, when all of us wildlife students are going through, we always talk about heat conservation and and Bergman's rule and, you know, the deer that are up north, they need to be bigger, you know, conserve heat and the ratio of surface area to, to volume and all that. But do we, it seems like in my mind, we don't also look at the opposite effect of it is really advantageous physiologically for a deer in the deep south not to weigh 300 pounds. And do you think that's always going to be a limit when we're talking about antler size is because we have a correlation at a population scale between body size and antler size. Is that always going to provide the ceiling of expectations for southern deer is dealing with dissipating heat? Well, I, I absolutely think that the Bergman's rule does apply, uh, that uh, uh, energy efficiency uh, it, it is be, having a small body and, and, a, and a high humidity and, and a high temperature re- regime to be able to dissipate that, that heat uh, is, is a major factor. Uh, habitat's a major factor too. Uh, you know, I think it's, it, it's extremely important to, to have a closed canopy forest and, uh, the, the Mississippi and, and other Southeastern states, uh, at, at least in, to some degree where, where bucks have a, uh, and and those for that matter have an, an escape environment where where they can uh have that shade and and coolness uh uh provided by the habitat to to dissipate some of that that heat stress um as to the the relationship with with antlers you know that's kind of a different story uh northern mexico and south texas have traditionally produced uh you know huge antler deer uh but on small bodies uh and you know i think there's there's actually some heat dissipation uh uh from you know that that antler growth and the and the velvet to uh, uh, release of, of, of that heat, uh, during, during the summer months. So, uh, I don't know that that necessarily has to be, uh, something that impacts antler growth per se, but definitely body size is, is, uh, a major factor in terms of, uh, the, the efficiency of that, that animal. And I've seen people who introduced uh, northern deer on on their properties, high fence properties in in Texas, uh, uh, that that were extremely stressed, and and that second generation of antlers from that, those animals are not second generation, but the second set of antlers from those animals after being released is is always you know. Uh, of of minor quality, uh, almost uh, without exception, and I, due to the stress, well, there's a lot of a lot of lessons to be learned through uh, talking about how things have been done and how they've changed over time, and and there's always a need for new information. You know, you talk, Harry, about the the metrics that you used early on to uh, help the agency convince the public, the, you know, the data that you used to convince and, and to make an argument, and we still use data today. Uh, have you had any, uh, back back in when you were active in academia and, and the research output uh, arena, did you have trouble with uh, science deniers back then. I mean, that's kind of a, a thing nowadays. Is it new to us, or has that been around a while? You know, there's there's always been a segment of the the population, and and I think 
with deer management, that's probably more true than <laughs> than my, many other things. That uh, uh, everybody's an expert when it comes to managing deer. So uh, there, there's always been that that component of of deniers, and I I see it even today. I mean, I see it in, in, in to a large degree in in some areas much more so than than others, uh, where they just refuse to to even educate themselves of uh, you know what what information is actually out there. Uh, and I don't know I, I don't know how you break through that uh, if, if when we look at uh, our our society today uh, and the polar, polarization that exists. I think. Uh, I think you're going to have that to the degree. All we can do is hope to educate the the highest percentage of the the people who will listen uh, that we can. Mm -hmm. Harry, this may be an an oversimplification, um, but in, in your years and years of experience, do you have any, uh, Do you have any tips for people in terms of um, the the properties or the hunting clubs that always had the most success did these one or two or three things? Did you ever see some commonalities that always existed with the people that were most satisfied five or ten years later? They all did one or two or three of these particular things. I think that the the two things... Number one, doe harvest. Uh, they they all took that seriously, and uh, you know I've never I, I've never yet seen a place that deer deer have been over harvested yet. To 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 be truthful, uh, that that deer uh, uh, couldn't rebound in in one or two years after after substantial reduction uh and and two i think uh uh protecting buck age though those were the two factors that that uh resulted in the 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 most hunter satisfaction down down the line Uh, a lot of other magic bullets out there you know what you plant in a food plot or whatever I, i mean uh Taking care of the habitat is is always a, a major factor, uh, and there's there's multiple ways of uh, of addressing you know how how a particular property is managed, but realizing the the limitations of of the habitat as they relate to that deer population and and a, achieving a substantial enough harvest. Yeah. One more, Harry. Um, as you know, because we're, we're all reading the same journals and we're all at the deer study group seeing these same studies, there's there's absolutely no question that there have been some deer populations severely impacted by predators and, and primarily some of the best examples with, with coyotes. And, and then when you add coyotes and bears, I mean, you they, they eat a lot of fawns. Um, do you have any experience where that has really been devastating from a deer management perspective, or is it just kind of a new norm that, yeah, we've got a lot of fawns that are being eaten, and we have just simply responded by not needing to harvest as much does? What, how, how do you generalize the new predator context that well, we have now? Well, I think it goes back to, you know, that metric issue again. Uh, being able to uh, document, you know, 20 years ago we couldn't do this, but now with camera surveys that uh, we, we've developed uh, where we can look at recruitment in the wintertime uh, and, and get a good assessment of, of what actual fawn survival took place and uh get a much better uh handle on on the 
the, the numbers of deer and both sexes that are and and fawns that are present, uh, uh, we can deal with that. Uh, I personally, I as you know, I own a little piece of property in Minnesota. It's covered up with bears, covered up with wolves, uh, and I'm still covered up with deer. Uh, you know, the predation is, uh, you know, the, the prey regulate the predator populations uh, more so than, than the other way around, I think. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's that, that trophic uh, pyramid uh, that uh, ten per- you got to have, you know, Ten percent can be predators, but but you know ninety percent is going to be uh, the prey. So uh, it's those numbers are still going to do what they do. Yeah. Well, Steve, I want to be uh, respectful of, of Harry's time. Uh, I was thinking we're we're pushing about our normal hour mark here. Any uh, any other things you want to discuss with Harry before we have to go? Well, I might follow up on, on your observation for your property in Minnesota, uh, Harry. Uh, you know, you don't see a, a a big depredation effect from your bears and wolves. Is that because you have adequate fawning cover, hiding cover on your property, and and that helps insulate the deer population from the predators? I I think that. To, to a big degree. I mean, uh, much of my property is consists of young forest, cut over forest that's uh, that's there that that provides more escape cover. But uh, uh, you know, I watch over the summer. I watch fawn numbers drop. Uh, almost every doe early on has has fawns. Uh, that, that I'll photograph, and by the end of the summer, maybe thirty uh, percent or forty percent of those those will will still have fawns. So, so predation is a is a major factor in in recruitment, but still the recruitment is more so than uh, uh, than than the habitat which stand long long term. You're still mm-hmm. going to have to have that that female harvest to keep keep things in check, particularly as that habitat changes. Like you just said, uh, uh, if uh, you know where where it goes from uh, young forest to older forest, uh, you know, you're going to need even more substantial uh, harvest to maintain that balance. Well, Harry, trying to wrap up here. Uh, do you have any uh, words of wisdom or pearls uh, to share with? Uh, we, we have a, a pretty wide variety of, of listeners. We have landowners, uh, we have hunters, and we have biologists that, that listen. Do you, could you think of a pearl or words of wisdom for <laughs> each of those uh, three groups that, hey, you know, here's something to keep in mind over the next five to ten years? Yeah, well, certainly – uh deer management is a long term uh thing there are no there are no magic bullets there that that will will overnight change things for you uh and i think the if there's there's one thing i would emphasize it's uh, uh stewardship of the resource uh and and realizing that deer are a keystone uh species they have tremendous impact on on their environment and other wildlife that that occupy that environment with them uh that not maintaining them in balance with their with their habitat uh seriously impacts the uh, uh forest uh habitat and quality and uh, seriously impacts uh, uh, a whole range of, of other species 
uh, of, of of wildlife uh, from songbirds and neotropical uh, migrants to uh, small mammals, reptilians, uh, you name it. They they they're a huge uh, factor in, in in environmental change and. Um, Stewardship involves taking care of that that resource so it maintains a balance. Well said. No magic bullets. No magic bullets. Don't think on the short term. Think the long term. Exactly. Yeah. But the one of the ways I tell that story, Harry, is that us as human beings, I think deer deer management is is very equivalent to a diet and people wanting a diet pill. We want to just take the diet pill and I I lost 30 pounds and I look like I've been weightlifting my entire life and the only way to have those results is watching what you eat and the weightlifting and I think the thing is very similar with with deer management. Sticking with all the concepts you talked about, it's it's the population management, it's the doe harvest. It's managing nutrition. It's managing buck age structure. It's strategically harvesting the bucks that you do. And if you do those things consistently enough over the long term, that equals success. Yep. Not only is success, it equals enjoyment. I mean, that's the, the, the most enjoyment I get uh, from, from managing deer and and. Uh, hunting deer is being able to pass that on to the next generation and and being able to show them what uh, what that stewardship in, involves and and how important it is to our quality of life. All right, well, Steve, you want to you want to wrap us up here? Well, Harry, it's been great visiting with you and and love the the historical context and the pearls of wisdom to to keep in our minds as we move forward. And uh, you've been a generation, uh, an inspiration to generations of deer biologists and, and graduate students, whether they feared you or, but they learned to love you and appreciate what you had to contribute to them. Uh, and I know Bronson's better for it, even though his knees may have been shaken <laughs> back there years oh, ago were. when you were coming up to the podium to ask a question. But you've been a great contribution to deer management nationally and to the development of a, a bunch of wildlife professionals that uh, are doing doing good work now, following the lead that you gave them. Well, thanks. thank you. Thanks for having an old man on. I, I appreciate it greatly, guys. Uh, uh, and and thanks for for doing the work you're doing because uh, uh, it's it's so gratifying to see that next generation. Uh, kick in and and make the contributions that you guys have made and i know that your students are going to make or, and are making right now so yeah. all right thank you so much harry we appreciate it and we will hopefully see you face to face at an upcoming meeting in louisiana yeah, i am planning on it so yeah we are too hope to be there i don't know if i'll say anything controversial or not but I'll be there. <laughs> it, if you'll be there, you most likely will. We'll we'll warn our students in advance to start worrying. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Great seeing you. Thank you, Harry. We thank the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation and the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowed financial support of our efforts. We also thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service, and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. If you have questions or suggestions, please log on to msudeerlab.com and click on the Deer University tab.